I am thrilled to be here with our first special guest of 2023, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Jay, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Barry. So Jay is a professor of medicine, economics, and health research policy at Stanford, but I suspect that you probably heard of him around 2020 when he co-authored what became called the Great Barrington Declaration. This was an open letter which advocated lifting COVID-19 restrictions on low-risk groups and protecting the most vulnerable communities. So it was against sort of universal lockdowns. What Jay and his colleagues foresaw was the unintended and perhaps catastrophic, and that will be part of our conversation, consequences of lockdown. And they saw those consequences long before many of our experts, including those at the highest levels of American and also global health public health global public health organizations. And yet the time Jay wrote it, it was considered something like heresy. As our recent reporting revealed, Jay was censored by Twitter and other big tech companies for his perspective. And as he recently wrote in an excellent piece in Tablet that we'll share in the Q&A so everyone can read it, he was also punished by Stanford, which we wanna also talk about tonight. So there's so much to cover with Jay. Distrust in medicine, the state of academia, the power of big tech, those are three of the areas of coverage that are really important to us at the Free Press. And it's why I think Jay is the perfect guest to kick us off for this year. Hundreds of you wrote in with questions already, and we're excited to hear more from you. So put any questions you have in the Q&A, and feel free to throw in some non-COVID-related questions as well, and I'll try and get to them at the end. Okay, Jay, let's get right into it. Let's go back in time to 2020. It's October of 2020, and people are really, really scared from this global pandemic that we called then the coronavirus, and now we call COVID-19. And states across the country had been under lockdown and other various restrictions. And to most people, at least most people I knew at the time, they were complying with these things. You, however, were alarmed by what was happening. And together with Dr. Gupta of Oxford and Dr. Kuldov of Harvard, you published the Great Barrington Declaration. In brief, because it was so caricatured, and when you go back and read it, it's so far off from the way it was described, what did the declaration say? And what did the three of you see at the time not to mention the thousands of people who co-signed it on it, that others did not. It's very simple what it said. It was, and, and it was based on one, uh, actually two scientific facts that I think nobody disputes. One is that the virus is most deadly for older people. For young people, especially children, it's very low mortality compared to some of the other risks that they face in their lives, and particularly like school closures. Um, for older people, it's uh, especially elderly people, it's, it's a high-risk virus. Uh, and so the the and then the second thing is that the lockdown strategies we followed were having tremendous harm on vulnerable people, on children, on working class people, on the poor. Um, there were reports coming in all through that summer from places like the World Food Program, the UN World Food Program, saying that there were going to be a hundred million people potentially starving as a consequence of the economic dislocations caused by the lockdowns. Uh, you know, hundred uh, tens of millions of people thrown into poverty worldwide. The school, there were estimates that the school closure, even in just in the United States, just from spring alone, spring 2020 alone, would cost over the lifetime of uh, children five and a half million life years. Why? Because if you interrupt schooling, schooling is the best investment we make as a society. You interrupt schooling, even for short periods of time, that has long ripple consequences. It's, it, I mean, the fact that we close school for so long is, is going to induce, has already induced generational inequality, right? It's, it's poor people who face the worst of it, who, who couldn't afford, you know, tutors or pods or whatnot. So that, that's what I was seeing during the whole, d- during all that summer. And it was also clear that the lockdowns were coming back. You know, they were eased a little bit during that summer of 2020, it was, but it was clear it was coming back. So the Great Branch Declaration just said the obvious thing from those two facts. Lift, uh, first, focus protection on vulnerable older people. We, we'd done such a bad job of that during the during the spring pandemic, a spring wave, and it was clear it was going to come back. We needed to do a better job at focus protection. So we gave a lot of ideas for how to do that do that uh, in the in the, in the Great Branch Declaration. I was hoping to have a longer, like a in-depth conversation with lots of other public health people. It's a local issue. It depends on how people live locally, that, that how best to do it. And then lift lockdowns for everybody else. That's it. That's the Great Barrington Declaration. So protect the vulnerable and lift up lockdowns for everybody else. Yeah. Right now in January, 2023, that seems deeply commonsensical to most people, even the people that were most sort of paranoid about COVID. 
at the time though, people treated you like you were saying something, not just disagreeable, but something that was maybe undermining science itself. Tell Mm. me about the reaction to that open letter. Four days after we wrote it, Barry, just four days, uh, it turns out from a FOIA email, the head of the National Institute of Health, Francis Collins, wrote to Tony Fauci, you know, the, the head of the NIAID, the famous Tony Fauci, um, that uh, the, he called me, Sunetra Gupta, who she's a fantastic epidemiologist, at, a professor at Oxford University, and Martin Kuldorf, who's designed the vaccine safety system, statistical st- statistics around the vaccine safety system the United States uses, at, then at Harvard University. Um, I mean, he wrote uh, that he called the three of us fringe epidemiologists. And then he called for a devastating takedown of the premises of the, of the, the, of the declaration, published takedown. Um, I started getting calls from reporters asking me why I want to let the virus rip. I saw newspaper articles where Tony Fauci was calling, uh, was was asking, you know, essentially using those terms. Let, why are they? Why, why do they want to let the virus rip? It's a responsible, complete nonsense to let the virus rip. We weren't calling to let the virus rip. We were calling for focused protection of vulnerable people. And I saw Francis Collins again in newspapers and places like the New York Times uh, saying, you know, that th- these are fringe ideas. We were proposing a herd immunity strategy, all kinds of nonsense in order to discredit us and this very commonsensical idea. Uh, it's commonsensical because that's exactly the strategy we followed for you know a generation of of respiratory virus pandemics successfully. Give um, me the most give me the most generous read of why they why those people, the Collinses and the Fauci's did what they did. What is the steel man case for why they decided to demonize you? I, I think I think they they genuinely thought that lockdowns were the only path, mm-hmm. that it was the only s- safe way to deal with this virus. Uh, and they thought that the the by locking down, uh, they they hoped that the vaccines would co- the vaccine trials would come out the way they thought they wanted it to come out. You know, the vaccine trials were on running. Um, they were about to get released, I think, in late December, early or, or late late November, early December. Um, and so they hoped that by locking down, we could save the world until the vaccines came, which were going to be very soon. And then we vaccinate everybody and we lift the lockdowns, and everyone saved and happy. So what they were, what I think that was the steel man case for what they were saying. They were saying, look, look up, it's dangerous to say, to shift to, to focus protection because that will expose some people don't need to be exposed uh, who will, then will be saved by the vaccines. We have a really smart question here from uh, Alexis. Was this a problem perhaps a first mover? In other words, because it originated in China and China had an authoritarian initial response, did it set the tone for the rest of the world? The answer to that question is absolutely yes. You can see this in FOIA emails actually from early in the pandemic uh, between Cliff Lane, who was a uh, aide to Tony Fauci, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 other other colleagues of, of his at the NIH. Cliff Lane went on a trip to to China in January or February 2020. Uh, it was a UN sponsored trip, essentially a, a junket to try to s- a see what China did and how did why or how did it work. He came back from that trip writing an email to to Mary, Maria Van Kirchhoff in the, at the at the uh, um, at uh, the World Health Organization saying, "Look, what China did worked. Mm-hmm. The January 2020 lockdown worked, albeit at great cost." He wrote, uh, and then he then he recommended something like that for the United States. I, I think that the brain trust at the NIH uh, decided based on the Chinese supposed success with the COVID lockdowns um, that the, the rest of the world needed it too, that the United States needed it too. If, if it's, you know, if with only a month of lockdown, China stopped the disease from spreading in Wuhan after it, had been, after it looked like it was going to spread. Well, why wouldn't we copy that was, I think was the reasoning. Hal Brody asks a really good question. In your opinion, was the decision to demonize the Great Barrington Declaration based on a panic as in we have to do something now, sort of what uh, the previous question was referring to, or was there any more maybe nefarious uh, incentive at work, perhaps money, Um, money, he mentions Pfizer, Moderna, et cetera, or was it maybe a combination of both in your view? I I mean, I think for different people was different things. I think for Francis Collins and Tony Fauci, uh, the problem they faced was that the, the uh, you know, you have people from Stanford, Harvard, Oxford writing this thing and you have, you have like, tens of thousands of scientists signing on, Nobel Prize winners signing on, very prominent people from universities. Um, all of a sudden they faced a PR problem. Mm-hmm. They previously had uh, you know, it maintained this illusion that there was a consensus in favor of lockdowns. That consensus was shattered by the existence 
of the Great Barrington Declaration. It basically told the world, look, there wasn't, a, there, in fact, there wasn't. There was a whole bunch of people that were really deeply unhappy, qualified people with, with the lockdown saying that there were different paths. So for them, it was a power move. They abused their power. Um, and money is is in, in part of it too. I don't think it's a motivation, but as a as a as a tool for power, right? They sit on top of t uh, tens of billions of dollars of funding for uh, American scientists, biomedical scientists. Uh, they, you know, I don't. I have a I'm a full professor at Stanford uh, with tenure. I don't get tenure unless I have an NIH grant. Uh, implicitly, when they did that, they sent a message to American scientists: you better get in line or else face risk to your career. Um, uh, and, and so I just, I think that, that that they abuse their power. There are other interests, of course, that were in favor of lockdowns for, for money reasons. You know, obviously pharmaceutical companies that had developed these, were developing vaccines stood to lose stood to lose or gain a lot based on on whether the lockdowns were, were in place or not uh, and whether the vaccines worked. Uh, the, the whole, a whole bunch of like, uh, of uh, you know, the healthcare industry was a 20% boost to for, for uh, for Medicare patients that were admitted for uh, in hospitals for for uh, um, if they had COVID diagnoses, uh, there was a whole range of money interests, of course, that are, that are important here. But to me, the most interesting thing ones is the the uh, the way that these scientific bureaucrats abuse their power. So it wasn't just Jay that you were demonized by really prominent people in the American public health establishment. You were also censored by big tech. One of the things that we discovered in our recent reporting in the Twitter files when we went digging is, and you were one of the very first searches I did, was that you were blacklisted by Twitter. Um, I called to tell you that and to find out ahead of the reporting if you had known it. So tell us, were you surprised to find out that Twitter had blacklisted you? Uh, well, first, uh, Barry, let me just say I'm grateful to you that you uh, that you exposed this. Uh, it was it was quite an important moment for me personally, just to have that black and white confirmation that in fact I was blacklisted. It turns out I was blacklisted the first day I joined Twitter. Um, and uh, uh, to to me, I, I you know everybody on, on Twitter, pro probably literally everybody, suspects that they're being suppressed somehow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I, you know, I, and it was for me, like for me personally, when I joined Twitter, I, I had a immediately had a very big following, like I you know 100,000, 200,000 people almost immediately. Um, but it was curious to me that like my messages weren't didn't seem to be reaching outside of my following. And uh, you know, your reporting confirmed exactly why. These trends blacklist, what it did is it made sure that my tweets got seen by my audience. So it looked like everything's fine as my as far as I'm concerned, but like it doesn't get seen anyone else anywhere else. I mean, I joined Twitter to try to to tell other people who didn't already agree with me about about my about um, you know the dangers of the lockdown and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think for me, it was, it was, it was a, uh, it was a confirmation of something I suspected, but didn't know for certain. And it was very important to uh, that your reporting put that into black and white. And the word blacklist, isn't that just a wonderful word? Like, it's just, it's like these 1950s era, uh, you know, sort of, I'm, I'm like this sort of uh, uh, communist sympathizer or something. And I'm going to be blacklisted from Hollywood. That, that, that's the sense that that's the kind of uh, weird vibe it raised. I, I mean, it's just, it's such a, such a strange time in American history that, that a big American communication company thought that that was a reasonable thing to do. Did it bring you a sense of relief or did it make you um, depressed about the state of the discourse in this country? It's a little of both. Um, I mean, I, I think that the fact that Twitter did this, I, I by the way, I think that, that if they did this, they didn't do this. Twitter 1.0 didn't do this by themselves. They did this at the behest of the of American government actors. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about the evidence I have for that in, in, in just a second. But I'll tell you, for uh, the, the way out of this is by exposing it, letting everybody know that this is happening. I don't believe the American people really want this kind of suppressed uh, dis discourse in our public space. space. Uh, I mean, we Americans, we, we are used to as our birthright to have the ability to say whatever's on our mind. Um, and uh, and and you know, I, I think the the idea that we could have an uh, have a con uh, our country be in a place where you know scientists can't speak to each other, that you get you get like suppressed, you get blacklisted as a consequence is is crazy. Um, so I I do think it, it's it's both depressing and a relief to finally see this being exposed, and I think a lot of people sort of joining the fight. Um, 
uh, let me just get back to why I think the government actors were doing this. Uh, if you, so I've been part of this lawsuit that the Louisiana and Missouri Attorney General's offices have brought against the Biden administration. And the, the new Civil Liberties Alliance has also been representing me personally. Um, that lawsuit has shown that a that a, across a dozen agencies of the federal of the of the health and of the health of, of the federal government, um, there are people in the government who sent directions to Twitter about what to suppress and in many cases who to suppress regarding COVID. Uh, there was a big campaign, for instance, by the Surgeon General's office to suppress COVID misinformation, and that included true facts that people just people in the government just found inconvenient. Um, you know, so so for instance, like the vaccine doesn't stop disease spread. That was known relatively early, and yet the government worked to suppress that idea using the pressure that they put on places like Twitter. Now, Twitter's not alone in the big media, big 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 tech. You know, I think Facebook faced the same pressure, Google faced the same pressure, Microsoft and and LinkedIn faced the same pressure. Um, it, they suppressed those ideas. They used their tremendous power to try to suppress free. Free discussion, free, free, free in in uh, in in the public square that was inconvenient to the policies they're putting forward. Jay, so you're painting a picture basically of uh, major heavyweights, maybe the biggest in the world of American public health, demonizing you or at least calling you ridiculous or fringe or yeah, undermining you. Then we are bringing in sort of big tech and the power of big tech, and then there was Stanford, your academic home which refused to stand by you, it sounds like, for having views that fell outside the so-called mainstream. And you wrote about this recently in a piece for Tablet. Here's what you wrote. Stanford did not fire me. I presume you're speaking to me from your office there right now or break my tenure for writing the Great Barrington Declaration. Therefore, it met the, it met the bare minimum standard of negative academic freedom. But Stanford failed to meet the higher standard of positive academic freedom, which would have required it to promote an environment where faculty members engage with each other respectfully, despite fierce disagreement. Tell me how it failed to meet the higher standard of positive academic freedom. What exactly happened to you, which is what this piece talks about. It was it was really quite a painful time for me uh, personally, because I've been at Stanford for 36 years. It's my home. Um, I felt like my my home it was invaded by aliens or something. Um, I um, uh, When I wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, I expected there to be at least some discussion on campus about it. Uh, the pe people, Mike Levitt, a, a chemistry Nobel Prize winner, had signed it. Uh, there were a whole, uh, Scott Atlas, of course, was President Trump's advisor, uh, who at least agreed with the spirit of it. I think he signed it also. Um, and there were, there were lots of people on campus, even junior people writing me, telling me that they agreed with the ideas of it, but they were afraid to sign it. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was instead this, this essentially like this campaign of, of ostracism. Um, at one, uh, so I, I, you know, at one point I was on a, um, on a, a webinar or a, like a round, a policy round table with Governor DeSantis. Mm -hmm like in March of 2021. And, you know, he asked me what policies I recommended for the state of Florida. And I told him, you know, uh, focus protection. We talked about child masking. I told him there wasn't any randomized evidence that child masking did anything. In fact, I don't think there's any randomized trials at all on child masking. Um, that video uh, and me being on that on the screen with Governor DeSantis led to uh, an episode which I still I'm never going to forget the rest of my life. There was a there was a poster campaign that some some group organized on campus where they put posters a picture of me uh, up next to like a you know del there was a delta wave of cases in Florida at the time, essentially accusing me of killing people in Florida, even though California has had almost exactly the same age adjusted mortality from COVID as Florida has had through the pandemic, and actually has had Florida actually has lower all cause excess deaths. There's no evidence that the, the California lockdowns did anything uh, to protect anyone in California. And yet I'm getting accused and they, they put it all over campus, including near a, a coffee spot, which they, you know, I'm pretty well known to go, 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 go get coffee from every day. Um, I mean, I was actually physically afraid to walk on campus. I complained to the, uh, to, the, to my department chair and they basically told me to talk to somebody who told me to reduce my online presence. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> Um, I mean, it was it was it was kind of, uh, and then then a, there was a, then there was like a, a secret petition that a hundred faculty circulated. They didn't name me directly, but they quoted me from that that roundtable. Uh, they quoted you know dangerous ideas like the Great Barrington Declaration, um, and then asked the president of the university to silence me. 
you know, to essentially to, 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 to censor me. Um, I mean, the president had to say no to that because that, again, nominally Stanford is in favor of academic freedom. But I'll tell you, um, this kind of thing happens because there was no open discussion on campus. I was never invited, for instance, to, to present in a seminar, which is how normally you would have, you know, you have these kind of, uh, I mean, I, I guess at Stanford was a French idea, but everywhere else it wasn't, I think. Um, uh, these these ideas uh, hashed out. You could have an open seminar where people can disagree with me. We could have a debate. I've been in debates with other people. Um, I was open to it, but no one else on campus was. And the leaders of Stanford did not allow that to happen, did not encourage that to happen, didn't organize one. Uh, at one point, Johnny Anides and and Mike Levitt, the, the chemistry Nobel Prize winner, John Eaney, is a very famous scientist at Stanford, went and spoke with uh, the leadership of Stanford and asked, well, why, why don't you set up a policy seminar? And we can invite people Debate. on both sides. Yeah, and, but they didn't do it. They would not have, they, would, they, they basically decided that our views were so far outside of the Stanford mainstream that it wasn't, wasn't uh, they weren't going to even uh, allow us to have a discussion openly with other people on it. It was, it was a really tough time to be on campus. Subsequently, now in hindsight, it seems like a lot of the ideas contained, the core ideas really contained in the Great Barrington Declaration are going to be vindicated or are being vindicated. Has anyone, and several people are asking this, several subscribers are asking this, has anyone apologized to you or expressed remorse or come back around and said, you know what, I should have been louder in my support of you? I mean, I've had a lot of a lot of people, uh, you know, junior people uh, and, and and others outside Stanford reach out to me and tell me that they that the, you know that that they uh, that, you know that they they support the ideas that they they certainly even if they disagreed with them they supported my right, right to speak, and uh, especially after that free pre that uh, that article in the tablet uh, where I told them told people about what I what I went through at Stanford. I've had a lot of sympathetic emails. Uh, a couple of people from Stanford, but I still have not heard from Stanford leadership, um, and um, I, I don't, I don't really understand it. It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. If I were uh, the, a leader at Stanford, uh, at uh, you know, like the head of a department, or or even the provost or the president, I would have reached out to a dissident faculty member and tried to like get some sense. Like I'm, I'm not an alien here. I uh, have been here for 36 years at Stanford. Uh, first as a student, now as a professor. Um, I, I have a lot of colleagues I've written with who still haven't reached out to me. Uh, now, there, I have to say, like, it's really easy personally to focus on the negative. I should be focused on the positive. There are a lot of really amazing people that have reached out to me um, and, and told me that 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 uh, to, to keep going to 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 uh, to, to um, and you know on, on, if I look back on it, I don't think I could have done anything different, Barry. Um, I mean, I basically. Well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, what's interesting to me is like the person that was caricatured in the press, and this was well before I ever met you. I met you very briefly at Stanford on a when I was there to interview Condi Rice. I, I think it was you know, I would have imagined you like a fire breathing contrarian and you're like the absolute opposite of that thing. So, you know, what I was going to, what I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but what I was going to say is it could have played out another way, right? It could have played out the way it played out for many other people who agreed with you, but decided, uh, eh, better me not die on that hill better for me to stay quiet. So actually, you know, it, most people I would say decided to, take that course. The curious thing is why you decided to write the declaration at all and why you decided to stick your neck out. Maybe at the time, and this is what I'm curious, maybe you didn't think it was sticking your neck out and you just thought it was commonsensical and you could have anticipated the response. So I'm actually curious, like, was it a, did it feel like, did you feel scared? Did it feel like you had to screw your courage to the sticking post to do that in the first place? Or was it easy and natural? Um, I mean, I, I knew that I, I was going to, put my career on the line by writing that declaration. I knew that for a fact. Um, through the summer, uh, the, I'd written a study, the, the, this uh, seroprevalence study early, earlier in the pandemic in April. And as a result faced, I mean, tremendous backlash from both within Stanford and also outside. Um, the seroprevalence study turned out to be right, but it, it estimated the mortality rate to be lower than people thought at the time. And I got all kinds of like, uh, so I just, and you know, the Stan Stanford handled it very, very poorly. Uh, and they sent signals to me in the summer of 2020 that if I just stayed silent, I, they would leave me alone. <laughs> so when I, when I signed the declaration, I knew I was sticking my neck out. Um, and, but the thing is very, I, I do, I've been studying 
health policy for most of my professional life. I've written on on um, uh, the economics of development in poor countries. I knew what was happening in poor countries as a consequence of lockdowns. I knew what was happening to children in the United States and elsewhere as a consequence of the of the school closures. I knew what was happening to the working class uh, as a consequence of these of these policies that only people that are relatively privileged like me could afford, right? Because I I'm not going to lose my job, right? Uh, at least I hope not. <laughs> um, and, and so I I I I couldn't do it. I couldn't not speak up when I saw these things. This was my this was my life's work was to speak about vulnerable people to design health policies that would benefit vulnerable people. And if I stayed silent like that at, at a time like that, I just there's no purpose to my career. Uh, I don't I don't care about my position uh, fundamentally. I care fundamentally about the people I study. And if I stayed silent, I was I was basically deserting them. Um, and so I just, I had to speak up and, and I knew, I, I remember talk, calling a friend and asking him to sign the declaration. And we had this conversation about like what my, what my reputation, what would do my professional mm. reputation. I knew I was putting at risk. Speaking of the vulnerable, vulnerable people that you had in mind when you wrote it, uh, Dr. Lucy McBride, who's been a guest on, honestly, very wonderful asks Jay, as you and I both know, children in the poor and marginalized populations suffered disproportionately during the pandemic. She has two questions. One, why do you think we have such an anti-child bias in the U S and two, why was there, why was your point of view viewed as racist? Um, so uh, the the, uh, the the anti-child bias is, is just still shocking to me, right? There was evidence from Iceland, uh, from Sweden, that keeping schools open was relatively safe. Uh, and, you know, even during the summer of 2020, it looked somewhat hopeful that, the, that we'd learned from our mistakes in the spring. Uh, the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, actually start, came out with like some statement in the, along the lines of we should open schools. The CDC came out with the, uh, the at least the head of the CDC came out with, with a, a statement saying it was important that schools open in the fall. But then all of a sudden it turned on a dime. You know, like I think President Trump said we should open the schools and everyone decided that because President Trump said it, we shouldn't do it. Um, as if, as if like, you know, it matters whether the president says it or not, as far as the truth of it is like, and the, the and, and, and we, um, in the United States, all of a sudden, especially in blue states, there was a sense of, that the children were super spreaders, that children were like, were, were they were the key vector by which, uh, the virus spread, which was just not true based on the evidence that was available at the time. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, I think that that we ignored the effect that these school closures on children is going to be something that that we in public health and look back with in shame for the rest of our careers. It it's created this like uh, domino effect of children being so far behind in their schooling, especially poor children, especially minority children. And I don't see how we ever get it back. Like it's 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 a generational inequality that we that we've I mean it was already we were already an unequal society before Barry, and we amplify that inequality. We have a sharp question from Jeff Joseph, who says, "We understand your speech was censored, but if you could, I'd like you to focus on the data. At this point, what data can you share that irrefutably supports the thesis of the Great Barrington Declaration?" Uh, I've, if I had to pick one data point, I'd, I'd point to the incredibly low all-cause excess deaths in Sweden. Sweden followed some, you know, it was imperfect, especially early in the pandemic. They didn't protect their vulnerable elderly very well. But later, but but very quickly, they they changed course. They kept schools open for kids under 15, 15 and under in the spring. Uh, in fact, all through the pandemic, um, they they. Uh, put in place, you know, policies asking people to stay home who were vulnerable, who were elderly, uh, if they were high risk during high periods of high transmission, they, they, they prioritize elderly for vaccination. And the results are fantastic, right? They're all cause excess deaths are lower than the vast, in fact, all, all, all but I think Norway through the whole pandemic. Um, uh, and, and, and uh, if you can, if you compare, and you know, they, they did not lock down. Uh, you didn't need the lockdown in order to protect the population is the lesson of Sweden. Um, and uh, the other data points I'd point to are just the harms done to children in poor countries from the school closures. I'll just give you a, one data point from Uganda. Four and a half million children after a year and a half or longer of, of school closures never came back to school, Barry, in Uganda. Four and a half million children lost forever 
to, uh, and uh, a lot of those kids were little girls sold into sexual slavery by parents who'd lost their jobs as a consequence of the economic dislocations caused by lockdowns. We in the West bear tremendous responsibility for the harm done to those little kids. Um, and, I, and I think, uh, so I think, I mean, I could go on. There's, a, there's an incredible amount of evidence that's piled up about the harms of the lockdowns uh, around the world to, 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 to poor, to vulnerable people, to working class, and also about the inefficacy of the lockdowns of protecting and literally anybody against, against COVID or much else in the long run. Um, but I think those two data points suffice. A lot of subscribers are curious sort of about the cultural currents driving the questionable choices that our public health agencies, that our medical institutions, and especially maybe that our universities are taking. Here's one that comes from maybe a colleague of yours, but he's anonymous. Dr. Bhattacharya, I retired in 2018 after spending 28 years at Stanford, once an august pinnacle of scientific research and freedom of expression. Would you please comment on the changes over the last 10 to 15 years that led to your colleagues directly and institutional leadership indirectly to attempt to silence you and others who were expressing differences of scientific opinion, once a common and important practice in the scientific peer review process? In other words, take us beyond just this moment and GBD, a great barrier to declaration and COVID, what were the factors that led to this kind of culture of censoriousness and intolerance? I mean, I, I, um, <laughs> it's just sad to think, like the, 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 the motto of Stanford University is let the winds of freedom blow in, in German for some reason. Um, I mean, that's, I've always loved that about Stanford. Um, in the 80s, there was, I remember uh, there was a protest led by Jesse Jackson who came on campus uh, arguing against uh, the, the Western culture stand, the Western culture classes that were in place. And as a result, there were enormous changes in, in, the, in the teaching of, of Western culture and the undergraduate education. Uh, as best I could tell, it didn't seem to affect the sciences very much. The sciences continued on as much as, as usual. Um, uh, but, and uh, I spent my career at Stanford where, you know, I would occasionally write papers that would stir up a fuss, uh, but it would be fusses that would happen inside the context of, of seminar halls, and we'd have ro robust discussions. That was my experience before uh, 2020 at Stanford. Now, um, during the previous 10 years, there'd been, you know, like say from 2010 to 2020, um, I'd seen some uh, sort of like the, the the leaders of Stanford started writing more politically laced pieces in when they would talk, talk, talk to the faculty. Um, you know, they take on political stances that previous to 2020, uh, you know, before that, that I really hadn't seen. But I just, you know, put that off as, okay, leaders get to say what they want. I didn't see that as affecting the capacity for Stanford faculty to discuss openly with one another. Um, I mean, in a sense, I was really just naive, uh, Barry. I just, I look back and I see, okay, yeah, maybe these forces were creeping up and I just didn't notice them because for me personally, I could publish my pieces and Stanford just let me be. Um, but and and after, perhaps and perhaps those who were in the humanities where this ideology had already more of a hold, maybe they noticed it before people in STEM. Yeah, I mean, I I do think that there is a monoculture at a place like Stanford. Like if you're, I mean, I'm not a Republican. I've never signed on, on to any party because I I'm in mean, public health. I figured I should be able to talk to anybody. Um, but uh, there are very few Republicans at Stanford, and I I think that that's a that's a problem. Like you have to be able to to, to if we're going to be if we're going to be a, a, an institution of higher learning that that serves uh, the, the United States, that, that's an American institution of higher learning, it sort of should reflect something like the ideological balance of, of forces inside the United States, or at least be tolerant of them. Um, instead, what you've with what I've seen, especially after the the election of Donald Trump, was this almost demonization of of anyone that di that that uh, that disagreed with. Uh, the reigning politics of, of folks at Stanford. Um, and, uh, you know, I, again, was in the sciences, I thought I thought I could just ignore it, it'd be fine. Uh, obviously, that was not right. Um, but I but I think, uh, I think that universities, especially top universities need to ask themselves serious questions about this. Like, you, if you mm -hmm. can't tolerate uh, what half the country believes at all, I don't even say agree with just tolerate it so that you can like openly understand what they're trying to say and then engage with them as you, fellow human beings, right or wrong, um, I, I think you really can't be a, a, a top university. Well, sp speaking of the ability to speak across the political divide, speak to people that disagree with you, uh, a reader, George Hahn, a student, asks this. He says, I'm a student. 
How should I and others try to have conversations with other students who believe that school closures were good and that masking children was the right move? How can you have a civil argument? And what are the top two or three things, Jay, that you would make in an argument with someone who still believes that school closures were good and that masking children was uh, necessary? I think the key thing is is stick to evidence if you possibly can. I mean, I think this is these some of these things are very emotional topics, and the and if so, if you can bring it out of the emotional on onto the onto onto data under under on and and then and then you're like in a conversation where you can actually move people, change people's minds, right? So, for instance, uh, if I'm going to look for data, I want to look for the highest quality data, the highest quality data are randomized trials, for instance, on masking before the pandemic. Turns out there were a dozen randomized trials, these are more, on masking and, and the flu. Turns out masking is very, there's no evidence from these randomized studies that the mass, that mass help slow the spread of the flu when, when worn in the community. It's just a fact, right? Uh, if, if, during the pandemic, there have been several randomized studies on masks and COVID, and all of them find either zero or very, very marginal effects. Those are just facts, right? So then you, have to let, then you can get into a conversation. Like once you have that fact in your mind, then you can ask, well, why didn't it work? Are there situations where it might work? You know, like if, a, if you're a trained hospital professional, I probably I think it probably does work. If you're wearing right. a high quality mask, um, uh, but not in a community setting. Why children? Well, you ever watch a child? You have a new child, newborn child. Can you imagine masking your newborn? I mean, like there's no way, right? Well, she's um, four months old, but no, having watched many a child uh, be on, you know, on an airplane or in a public park. Remember when people were doing that? I live in LA. Some people still are masking kids. I mean, they're like, they're, it literally is an invitation to touch your face more. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I, frankly, I'm sympathetic. I don't like wearing them either. So, uh, but, 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 but that, that's, that's besides the point. The key thing is that people thought of this, I, like, I mean, I blame public health, public health turned this into this question of empathy. If I wear a mask, I'm a good person. My mask protects you, your mask protects me. And so people moralize something that should never have been moralized. It should have just been a question about data. Um, uh, on school closures, you don't have to look very far. The data on on um, on the learning losses are, are have started to come out, and they're tremendously bad. You know, you have uh, learning losses that are that you know one or two years. Kids are one or two years behind on basics, uh, and you don't have to. And you can think about why. Like, how do you teach? A, a kindergartner or first grader to read over Zoom. You can't. It's not possible. I mean, that means that the kids are going to get delayed in their reading. Uh, they're going to get delayed in, in in the most basic things they ought to know. Um, and that has lifelong consequences. We're starting to see that. We've, the, the data are coming out on that already. And was it avoidable? Again, you can point to Sweden. Sweden, they kept schools open for everyone 15 and under through the whole pandemic. They had no learning loss. Mm -hmm. And they're... And they're um, and their and their uh, teachers actually had COVID at lower rates than the rest of the population, at least in the spring of 2020, when they when they stayed open, because um, the kids were not super spreaders. Okay, I have a tremendous number of questions that I want to try and get through, so I'll ask them quick, and you'll answer them quick, ideally. A lot of questions about vaccine safety for kids. What is your rule of thumb on whether or not children should take the vaccine? I think unless there's a special reason to take the vaccine, if there's some some medical reason, special medical reason, uh, the benefit to the vaccine to kids is very small because the rate of death of, from getting COVID is very small. And so you have, I think you generally need a very, very good reason to do it. I, I think it should have been left up to, to uh, pediatricians and their and uh, and parents about whether the kid kid should be vaccinated, not something that's put put on by force. There's a few interesting questions about Africa, Jay. Why are there such low COVID deaths in Africa and why is no one talking about it? And someone else relatedly asks, Carolyn, the fact that in much of Africa, only 6% of the population was vaccinated in Uganda and COVID is apparently not a big problem. It's gone. So what's going on in Africa? I think the, the, the most important thing about Africa is that I think 3% of the, of the population is over the age of 65. And so that's why uh, you had such low COVID deaths. The countries that have more, a higher proportion elderly, like South Africa, have higher death rates from COVID. Um, so I think that, that that's, the, that's the central reason why it wasn't such a big deal in Africa. It spread everywhere in Africa. There were very few places that had the capacity to put in lockdowns that would protect anyone from it. And so it spread everywhere. Most of the population was probably infected. Uh, they undercount their cases. They undercount their COVID deaths. So there's some un uncertainty around that. 
um, in many countries there. Uh, but as a as a rule, because they were less likely to be uh, older, they they fared better. Okay, so from Africa to China, uh, subscriber Kelly McCoy asks, what's happening in China right now? Certain epidemiologists have warned that between one and two million people could die in the upcoming COVID surge. Hasn't the virus weakened to a point that it wouldn't kill that many people? What do you know about what's going on in China? Uh, it's heartbreaking, Barry. It's absolutely heartbreaking. So what, what's happened in China is that uh, I, I think early on in the pandemic, um, for whatever reason, much of East Asia and China was protected against the earlier variants. Like they didn't actually have very severe outcomes from from them, um, and, uh, and we could just debate about why. I, I still think it's a mystery why. To me, uh, I have some hypotheses, but it's not worth getting into. What what happened very clearly though is that Omicron evades whatever immunity they previously had, and and whatever and it's an incredibly infectious variant. Uh, all the all the variants have been infectious, but this one especially. Um, and because it evades both prior immunity. Um, and the Chinese population had not really been exposed to the virus previously in, 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 in any great numbers. Um, they had an immune, relatively immune naive population. Hmm. And uh, it's done, the vi now, and is Omicron less severe? I think generally it probably is a little less severe, uh, but the key thing that protect, that's different between Om for Omicron for us, the United States versus China, is that we had tremendous immunity, both from COVID recovery, from prior variants, and also the vaccines, we vaccinated a large part of our elderly population so that Omicron appeared less mild. China didn't have the benefit of either. They didn't vaccinate their older population very efficiently and they didn't, they were immune naive. And so it's unfortunate and, and their co their lockdowns did tremendous harm to their population. Um, and then now that when well, they finally realized they couldn't do the lockdowns, they let the virus rip through the populations, including older populations. And now you're seeing tremendous death, tremendous uh, harm from the virus and also the, 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 mm -hmm. the knock on effects from the lockdowns. There's a lot of questions. Uh... I think really important ones about how we can find accurate, reliable information to make wise health and public health decisions. One of the, and I'll, I'll add to that. So that's Lauren's question. As a lay person, how do you find accurate, reliable information to make wise health and public health decisions? I will add to that, that one of the reasons I think it's been so dangerous um, at the way sort of the legacy press has expanded the idea of what counts as misinformation or disinformation is that mud it muddies the waters for actual disinformation. So if you claim, for example, that to suggest that cloth masks don't really do much good for about two years, that was considered mis or disinformation. You could be kicked off of platforms for saying so. Now, it turns out that was actually true. And yet once you've told people that that's disinformation, all of a sudden they're falling down the rabbit hole and considering wild theories like Bill Gates is trying to implant chips in everyone's brain for the great reset theory or whatever it is. So in a world, Jay, in which you know you have the label of misinformation being slapped onto things and people, maybe including you, that don't at all deserve it, how are people to judge? And what are your rules of thumb for how you, as a person in the world, how do you judge, not just public health information, scientific information, but just information you're reading in the world? What are your rules of thumb? I mean, it's, it's frankly, it's easier for science, right? So I've, I'm trained in like reading scientific papers um, and I'm a, a, a very skeptical about basically every paper I read. And there's a hierarchy of evidence where like randomized trials are better than than, than other than than other methodologies. Um, I, I think I think that in in science, what what ends up happening is you have debates, you have discussions, uh, and the truth emerges slowly over time. Not as a as, as the idea that you can know with certainty upfront uh, about the right policies or the right uh, you know some some basic scientific facts about when in brand new areas is 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 just folly. Um, and so like a lot of the mistakes I think people make are they they follow some person as a, as if they were gurus that would know the truth from not falsity. And, and you can gen, you can generalize that. like the, the government doesn't is not in a position to be able to tell the difference. The New York Times is not in a position to be able to tell the difference. Really, their only way out, it's the only way is, is we learn is from open disagreement with each other. And then you can look and see: Are people engaging logical fallacies? Are they are they trying to like demonize other people to in order to discredit them, and so that you don't listen to them? 
Well, I, I, whenever someone does that, I just stop listening to that person. I'm almost no matter what, because why are they engaging in these logical fallacies instead of trying to engage with ideas? I, I, I look to see, even if I disagree with someone's ideas, I, I want to see what evidence they're bringing. And I want to, I want to be open to the fact that I might be wrong. Um, about basically everything. I mean, I just, I think that's the only way we can, like we can, and, and what that means then is we're going to be wrong a lot of the time, but we're going to self-correct. That's why that free debate and free discussion is so important. If you don't allow that self-correction, to, that, that, that correction to happen, that debate to happen, then no, there's no self-correction. There's just this, this like dominant view. And for years you go with cloth masking is, is if you don't cloth mask, you're a dangerous killer. But in fact, people went out wearing cloth masks, thinking it protected them and made vulnerable elderly people went out and they probably died as a consequence of it, thinking they were protected when they weren't. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I, th I think it's one of these things where like uh, censorship is, is, is over the long run and short run, I think very bad for people's health. I agree with that. Um, two things. First of all, Lindy is writing me in, which I appreciate Lindy. She says, as a seasoned parent and grandparent, as I watch the webinar, webinar, I feel compelled to tell you that I need to keep my hands away from my face because as my baby gets bigger, I'm going to catch every single illness she brings into my house. Don't worry, Lindy, I am not offended. And <laughs> thank you for putting that out there. Okay. Here's a few uh, short, tight scientific questions. Dr. Jody Chambers asks you this, Jay, what are your thoughts on the future of mRNA vaccines? Uh, I, I think that uh, the vaccine mandates have undermined the confidence of a lot of the public mRNA technology. And so I, I, I think that the technology itself is quite promising, but needs further development and certainly uh, further uh, further work by the scientists by, by scientists and uh, and regulators to to to, to establish uh, in the public mind confidence in the technology itself. Um, that would start by, like, for instance, taking seriously the fact that it has caused side effects, in uh, bad side effects in some people, you know, for instance, myocarditis in young people. Don't gaslight people over that. Tell people the truth about that and then work to, tr to try to improve it. I think um, I'm, I'm actually still amazed by the mRNA technology, the fact that it came out so quickly um, I didn't anticipate that at the beginning of the pandemic. I thought it would take a long time to get a vaccine. And I'm hopeful that it might be able to be put to other uses, but not until it's been worked out, you know, worked out a lot more and not until public health has restored trust in the population. There's a lot of noise on social media about the side effects of the vaccine. Uh, one of the subscribers asks, is there any evidence, is there any data that the initial vaccines have had negative health impacts beyond what would be statistically normal for other drugs and vaccines? Uh, I, there is a paper by Joseph Fryman and Peter Doshi and his group that suggests that the rate of serious adverse events found in this vaccine in the randomized trials that the, the Pfizer ran and Moderna ran is something on the order of one in 800. That's higher than most other vaccines. Now, does does that mean that the vaccine killed more people? than I think that certainly that's not true. I think the vaccine saved saved a lot of lives, in particular, older people's lives. I, I believe on net. Did it also cause some harm to some older people? Absolutely. Like there was just a recent signal, for instance, put out by the FDA that the vaccine causes uh, uh, pulmonary embolism at, in, at, 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 you know, at some rate in older people. Uh, on the other hand, the benefit, so the, the way to think about this vaccine again is, is benefit versus harm. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be different for different people. For ch young children, the benefit is small and there, you, then any harm at all says don't take it. For older people, the, the, when the when it was really high risk, the, the disease was spreading around. You never, no one had uh, people were immune naive. The vaccine had tremendous benefit, and some harm. And on net was worthwhile to take. I was very happy when my mom was vaccinated. She's the eighty three year old um, in in L A. Um, just relieved about that. So I, I think um, it should have been something left to physicians talking with patients, taking into account the particular situation the patients were in, not something that was done by force the way we did it. Jay, as I'm sure you noticed, um, when DeMar Hamlin collapsed on the football field uh, the other night, thank God he's making recovery, the initial reaction, almost like a virus, you could say, on Twitter was this hashtag died suddenly. And the idea that surely it had to be the vaccine that caused uh, his injury, thank God, not his death. And there's been a similar sort of um, contagious outlook when you've seen uh, high school, high, high school uh, boys, especially, and, and connecting those incidences to myocarditis. What do you make of that? 
Is it just a symptom of Americans' lack of trust? Is there something to it? How do you explain that sort of mass reaction to those events? Well, it is a reality that something like one in 2,000, one in 3,000 young men who take the vaccine, young meaning from like, say, 15 years old to 40, um, taking the vaccine had myocarditis, one in two, one in two or one in 3,000, something on that order of that. I mean, people are still debating exactly the rate, but that's, that's I think, on that order. Um, so th- what the, that, that concern reflected a, a reality about the data about the vaccines. Um, now, in his particular case, I, I don't know, I don't, I, who can say, it depends on, I mean, you need to do a lot of studies to, to sort of establish exactly what happened. And of course, I'm not his doctor, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't weigh in on that. I will say as a cultural phenomenon, you're absolutely right, Barry. People are thinking that this vaccine causes harm to young men. People are thinking that. And when you see an event like this, it's ambiguous about this, but but suggests it, people latch onto that idea. You can't stop people from latching on that idea by by suppressing it, by calling it misinformation or whatnot. The the it's the the cultural phenomenon of thinking that this was caused by the vaccine is a reflection of the distrust caused by uh, in, in public health caused by public health itself both by its overstating of the effectiveness of the vaccine and stopping transmission uh, and a whole series of other mistakes that public health made during the pandemic. Uh, and, 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 and I think it's fueled by the censorship. You know, in the Soviet Union, people used to listen to Pravda and they they automatically believe the opposite. Hmm. We're exactly. kind of in that, I mean, it almost feels like we're in that same situation now with much of the press. A few questions about gain of function research. What are your thoughts on it? And what are your thoughts on the future of US funding of gain of function research? I believe gain of function research is tremendously dangerous. I don't think that it was wise to restart it. Uh, I, I know that Tony Fauci was a proponent of it through much through much of the last decade and a half. Um, and I think that we should we should end gain of function work in, in some kind of international treaty. Uh, because it uh, the promise of it to predict pandemics failed. Uh, we know that 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 is dangerous to work with some of these pathogens in la- laboratories in the way that the gain of function work envisions. Um, because and they leak out of laboratories in Taiwan, for instance, in 2021, a, a laboratory working with the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually had a lab leak. 2021 documented. Um, so I think we need to end our support of gain of function work as, and I think it should be an international treaty to do so. Okay, two questions uh, from people relating to universities. I'll make them into one. Thane says this, having experienced institutional opprobrium, big word, and censorship from one of the world's premier university communities, and recognizing that this is occurring across academic institutions globally, and seemingly the greater the prestige, the worse the monocultural group think, do you have practical ideas about how, how higher education can be reformed to return to its classical liberal roots? And that dovetails beautifully with a question from a mom named Amy who has 16 year old twins and says, we're starting to look at universities. We're trying to find colleges that are committed to intellectual fairness. Have you been impressed by any universities and their commitment to intellectual fairness and rigor? And where would you be comfortable sending your kids to study? So. What are the schools that still have maintained sanity? Where would you send your kids to study? And for those schools that have seemingly lost their way, any practical ideas about how they can right the ship? Uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, for, let me start with the, the, the easiest question first. Uh, how do you fix this? <laughs> um, I, I think the key, the key thing is leadership. It, it's not, it just, it just takes a, a generation of, 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 uh, of courageous leaders at universities to say, this is the norm. You are going to disagree with each other. I think we, so, I, you're seeing some of that, at, for instance, the University of Chicago, right, with its University of Chicago free speech statement. statement uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the University of Austin that you're uh, that you're engaged with, Barry. I think those are examples of how you can set a culture where this kind of free disagreement is expected, and demonization of the other side is 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 seen as as outside the bounds, right? Where- uh, so would you recommend a parent send their kids to Stanford these days, given your experience? Okay, so this one's harder for me because um, I still love the place. Um, and I actually, my daughter did actually go here and just graduated recently from it. Um, I still think it's possible to get a good education at a place like Stanford, um, but you have to work very hard. And the, and what I, what the, the old thing that you, you might once have gotten out of Stanford that you won't get is free discussion with your friends about the most important difficult topics, what you'll instead get is self-censorship. 
you'll get you'll you'll get fear that if you say something out of line, you'll get canceled. That will absolutely happen to your kid if you send that person if you send your kid to Stanford. That will absolutely happen. Um, and it takes a, a very brave kid to say, "No, I'm not. I don't. I don't. I don't think this is right." I, I, you know, to say things that are outside of the politically correct uh, sort of things that are allowed to be said. I think that that um, now for uh, so I think I think if you want. <laughs> if you want your kid to get a good education, bless you. Uh, if you Thank want you. your kid to get a good education, you can get one at Stanford. You still can, I, I believe. Um, but are you are you what, what you won't get is the kind of civic education that we that was routine in top liberal arts colleges once upon a time, where you would engage. I mean, I remember when I was in college, I would have all these like knock down, drag out, silly discussions with with my friends late into the night. Um, I don't think that happens so much anymore. Jay, I just want to go back to the beginning as a last question. You said that you knew that in putting out the Great Barrington Declaration, you would be risking your reputation and, and maybe your career. What resources did you draw on that allowed you to have the courage to do that? I think that's like one theme I'm really, really interested in is the theme of courage. Um, and I know it's one that our readers are extremely interested in. So, you know, without forcing you to be self-aggrandizing, and if you could just be a little self-reflective for a second, put yourself on the couch for us. Where did you get the bravery to do what you did, knowing what the consequences might be? Um, uh, my, you know, my, uh, Barry, I, I've never... Um... My my purpose is is in my life is not to win awards. I, my purpose when I when I okay. I mean I'll, I'll, I mean I, I I'm I'm a I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. For me, um, if I sacrifice my life to benefit others, that's that's a life well lived. I very very strongly believe that. I didn't enter academics for to grant like just like a, so for instance when i came up for tenure a lot of people who come up for tenure they're very very nervous because they put their entire self-worth and identity into that decision you get rejected for tenure and people and people like they go into this negative downward spiral because their entire self-worth is in their status my self-worth is not in my status it just isn't um and i think that was the definitive thing for me my self-worth is in have I lived a life worth living? Have I lived a life for others? Um, and that's, I mean, so if, okay, I mean, it's not like it's a happy thing. It makes me happy to like lose my career or reputation. That's not what I want, but I can look back on what I did and say, look, I did what I was supposed to do. Hmm. I have a per I, I serve my real purpose. Not the, the, the purpose isn't to like get another line in my CV. Um, and I think uh, that's, mm -hmm. to me, that was the main thing is I don't, I don't, I, I have a, a family that loves me. I have the the sense that I, you, you know, even if I, even if I, I get called fringe by the, um, the head of the NIH, I'm still doing what I'm supposed to do. I have to tell you, I'm really, really glad that you shared that because I, I, I'm considering writing a book about this subject, about the subject of courage, because I'm very, very interested in where it comes from. And I do find that one common thread is A, people who have sort of stated either to other people or themselves what, or articulated to themselves what the purpose of their life is beyond status, beyond prestige, beyond climbing a ladder. And another thing that a lot of these, a lot of people who I view as having courage have in common is some kind of faith in something well beyond themselves, well beyond their career, well beyond their, even, even their own community. And, um, I'm really, really glad you shared that. So thank you. Um, it's been an hour and I'm going to let you go have dinner. I want to thank Jay Bhattacharya for joining us. And I want to thank the 700 of you who joined us tonight. We got hundreds of questions. I joined us tonight. We got hundreds of questions, I, um, but we'll find ways to answer the ones we didn't get to.